The Antikythera Mechanism Found in a submerged shipwreck on the island named Antikythera, hence its name, back in 1901, this marvelous machine does not exist in literature, nothing like it. According to some mainstream historians, some guy or group suddenly decided to make the most complicated analog machine in the world, all without training, without books, without a factory, without institutionalized knowledge. If you pay attention to how all machines evolve, a prototype is first made, barely functional and heavily flawed. And on observing a flaw, a modification is made to address it on a new iteration, not the existing one. With each iteration, with each improvement, four complicated machines, made of multiple parts, and whose parts are measured in nanometers, cannot be molded by human hands. A factory is required. By extension, the construction process of a machine is recorded and can be recreated with the exact result. A better model of an existing machine is the recreation of an old one, with new modifications in its creation process. Sounds complicated? Let's envision the development of a simple analog astronomical clock, only a few gears to show the position of the sun on a specific hour or day. Only once that iteration is successful, do you add the gears for the moon on the next iteration. Now, you can combine them to calculate the eclipse for the new iteration. And for future iterations, do the same for all the celestial objects. Now you need new gears to correct for specific nonlinear events of each celestial object. My point is, this refined machine could have only been the result of thousands of iterations. Look at this. Do you believe a group suddenly completes a fully functional machine of unbelievable complexity without having previous iterations? That you can have software reach version 8.0 without version 0.1? Assemble this by hand? This level of refinement and complexity is necessarily the result of mass production. It so happened one of them was found in a shipwreck. Who says there aren't more of the exact same model? Especially so if the one found in the shipwreck wasn't created in that era, but in the previous, and the ship carrying it was carrying an ancient item, so it's even more ancient for us. After all, the easiest way to make an astronomical clock with these features is to make it room-sized. They managed to polish it down to the point of almost fitting in your pocket book-sized. How many iterations did the desktop computer's computation power require to be reduced to a mobile phone? A device to track the stars, all without electricity, functioning always anywhere, any year. This is technology superior to our own, no company produces such a device. Ultimately, it is more logical to accept that the ancient Greeks we know of simply inherited the infrastructure of their ancestors after the worldwide cataclysm which sank Atlantis. But they remembered fragments of their destroyed technology and even possessed some antiques. Imagine such a reset. Survivors of our generation would share stories to our children of cars, and they would think of metal horses, fed with fire instead of grass, drinking black water instead of normal water. Just like in Vedic texts, you have swift flaming arrows shot towns away, where a single arrow put a city to fire, aka missiles. Ancient Nukes The 4,000-year-old city of Mohenjo-daro, is located in present-day Pakistan, whose surface layer is ash, radioactive ash, ash with high levels of radioactivity even to this day, and with skeletons who bear no signs of injuries, killed instantly. And around the claimed impact site, everything was glassified, even rocks. A city whose civic planning matches our own. In the internet, the following infamous translation of a passage from Mahabharata of Yasa should grab your attention. A single projectile, charged with all the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and flame, as bright as a thousand suns, rose in all its splendor. A perpendicular explosion, with its billowing smoke clouds. The cloud of smoke, rising after its first explosion, formed into expanding round circles, like the opening of giant parasols. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnis and the Andhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. 
The hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. The blue subtitles are emphasis of radiation symptoms. I cannot read or write Sanskrit, hence I apologize for no side-by-side -side comparisons. But this is what I found from the definitive translation of the Mahabharata by Kizari Mohan Gangali, which is 5,800 pages. Page 5775, Book 16. When the next day came, Samva actually brought forth an iron bolt through which all the individuals in the race of the Vrishnis and Anakas became consumed into ashes. Indeed, for the destruction of the Vrishnis and the Andhakas, Samva brought forth, through that curse, a fierce iron bolt that looked like a gigantic messenger of death. The fact was duly reported to the king. In great distress of mind, the king, Yugrasena, caused that iron bolt to be reduced in a fine powder. Men were employed, O oh king, to cast that powder into the sea. At the command of Ahoka, of Janardana, of Rama, and of the high-souled Vabru, it was again proclaimed throughout the city that from that day, among all the Vrishnis and Anhakas, no one should manufacture wines and intoxicating spirits of any kind, and that whoever would secretly manufacture wines and spirits should be impaled alive with all his kinsmen. The streets swarmed with rats and mice. Earthen pots showed cracks or broke from no apparent cause. At night, the rats and mice ate away the hair and nails of slumbering men. Many birds appeared, impelled by death, that were pale of complexion but that had legs red of hue. Asses were born of kine and elephants of mules. Cats were born of bitches and mouse of the mongoose. In cook rooms, upon food that was clean and well-boiled, were seen, when it was served out for eating, innumerable worms of diverse kinds. The chastiser of foes commanded the Vrishnis to make a pilgrimage to some sacred water. The messengers forthwith proclaimed at the command of Keshava that the Vrishnis should make a journey to the sea coast for bathing in the sacred waters of the ocean. The two translations have suspicious many differences, for example, on hair or nails falling out. Rats are omitted in the first translation, but they both depict the same imagery. An iron bolt or missile, instantly burning everything. Followed up by an ash cloud, fine powder in the translation, which was hauled to the sea. And the resulting radiation caused mutations, disease, and the inability to produce or consume food. In short, the aftermath of a nuke. And let's not even touch Vimanas, which were flying vehicles, whose description matches that of our description for UFOs.